Welcome everybody. Good afternoon from Bogor, Indonesia. So billions of people suffer from inadequate access to water and in some cases extreme heat events. So this fact motivates a group of global scientists to provide full insight into this such hot world. So celebrating the International Day of Forest and World Water Day, the Forest Tree and Agroforestry Program of CGLR is honored to present you a Global Future Symposium. So this is uh, our interaction with you all to, to see how tree and forest become the prime regulation, regulator for water, energy, and carbon cycle. And hopefully this will also contribute to the Global Climate Adaptation and Mitigation Agenda. So my name is Beria Limona. I'm here with uh, colleagues in ICRAF C4 office in Bogor. And I also would like to say hi to my uh, colleagues, Peter Menang from ICRAF uh, Nairobi. Peter, are you joining us? Yes, uh, we can see Peter online, so he will uh, send you also a good, uh, good afternoon or good morning from Nairobi. So, first of all, may I introduce our uh, opening speaker, Dr. Peter Hongren from C4 will give his opening remarks. Please, Peter. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll be very, very brief because I think everybody's interested in the substance of, of, of this uh, symposium. Um, and there I am on the screen, that's good. So, welcome to all here at C4 campus in Bogor, Indonesia, as well as at uh, ICRAF in uh, Nairobi, in Kenya, as well as everybody online. Um, this symposium, as we heard, is organized by the Forestries and Agroforestry, the CDAR program on that uh, looks at global research for development um, and is led by C4 with uh, ECRAF as one of the main partners. Um, so, as we heard, today is really important. We are today at the International Day of the Forests, and tomorrow is the World Water Day. It's very fitting. First you have forests, and then you have water. And, and uh, that's why the, the symposium is linking the, the two aspects. And uh, the, the symposium is based on a review paper that was published this month in uh, Global Environment Change by David Ellison from, uh, from my old university, the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. Uh, together with 21 other scientists um, and they were looking at the roles of forests and trees in the water and energy cycles and how this interacts with the climate. Um, in this symposium 10 of the co-authors of this paper will present various aspects of, of this topic and I think this is really timely because what we need is really a new narrative about forests and climate and water. Uh, for a long time, we've had a debate where forests seem to be equal to a storage of carbon. And a lot of the international policy debate has been about how do we make sure to keep as much carbon in the forest and away from the atmosphere as possible. <coughs> that way, we will improve um, and maintain the global climate. Well, this is a very good objective, but it's not really painting the whole picture. Uh, forests and trees are obviously important for many, many other things. I won't go into them, but even if you look at just the climate, forests and trees are important in many other ways than to store carbon. We will look at some of them during this symposium. How does forests and trees affect local climates, regional climates? How do they uh, affect the water cycle and make sure that we can, we can both grow um, uh, plants as well as enjoy uh, fresh water, as we all know, Jakarta has its, uh, its safe drinking water supplied from the forests outside Bogor. This is a major benefit of, of, of the forests and a good connection between forests and water. Um, so we're, it, it really is important that we change this narrative and have a more holistic perspective on how forests and trees can contribute to a better climate for the future. Um, Water is a very, very central part of that equation. Um, part of this is also that we need to 
as part of this narrative, move away from some, let's say, top-down perspectives that we have a global climate and that needs to be mitigated and, and, and supported by uh, the global forests. Uh, we will discuss during this symposium many other ways that also look at the bottom-up or even the bottom-bottom perspectives of, of how to manage forests and, and water cycles. Um, so another way to look at this is that we had a couple of years ago both the Agreement on Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate. And of course, these two major agreements and achievements go together. We will not be able to handle the future climate unless we also achieve most or all of the SDGs. And conversely, we will not be able to achieve the SDGs unless we manage to keep our climate within bounds. So, as as a consequence of this, forests, trees, and landscapes are really at the center of attention. Um, the symposium we're going to listen to in the next few hours will be, I hope, really informative to many of us. It will help, hopefully, policies to, uh, to be formulated that take into account not just the carbon storage aspect of forests when it comes to climate, but all other benefits and, and uh, uh, goods and services that we derive from forests and trees, not least water. So again, welcome, and I'll hand over to, uh, back to you again. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. So I'm pleased to see that our first speaker, Professor Daniel Mudiarso, so, uh, Professor Daniel Mudiarso, he is a senior scientist from C4 and also a senior lecturer from the Bogor Agricultural University. So, by Daniel, that's we, how we call him. Uh, he will present on the relevance for the global climate policy on this topic. Uh, by Daniel, the floor is Hello. yours. Hello, Dave. Yes, by Daniel. Okay, uh, thank you very much for. Uh, being a commodity. Yes, Nairobi can hear you very uh, well. Than it was scheduled before. What I'm speaking today I, is uh, to bring yes, the issue yes, of... Yes, we can hear you from Nairobi now very well. ...in the yeah. global uh, climate policies. As Peter mentioned, it is very timely. Today we are celebrating the International Forest Day, mm -hmm. and tomorrow is World Water Day, so it's, it's, it's appropriate to bring forest and water to this audience. Uh, the uh, topic that is uh, basically based on our work, uh, almost two years work with the group, which was published two weeks ago, is very timely because uh, it's difficult to bring issue of water in the climate debate. But forest is recognized in there. So my, my premise, I think, is that forest is recognized in the climate policy, but not water. Although we know that water or water vapor is a greenhouse gas, but its lifetime is so short before it is precipitated, so it is not very important greenhouse gas. So I'm, I'm going to organize my talk in uh, for a big topic. One is to look at the uh, UNFCCC, the climate treaty that we have especially on the objective which is stipulated in Article 2. And then, more practically, the recent development with the Paris Agreement, where we can see how forest and water can be brought in uh, the debate, based on what we've been producing by some big messages in the paper, which I call is uh, five bold messages for the audience, especially the audience of the climate change debate. And then we'll see how we can enter into the debate by bringing this forest and water in combination. So the objective of climate change convention really is to control or to stabilize the atmospheric greenhouse gases, as you can see in, in um, Article 2 of the convention and also to, to prevent climate change to happen. So it was envisioned that that kind of change uh, will happen about 
hundred uh, hundred years when the uh, climate uh, when the CO2 is double and the temperature will be reaching four degrees C. And then people start to, to think it very seriously and arrive to a decision in the legally binding Kyoto Protocol in 1997. And it was a very small step with 5% emission reduction at the level of 1990, but it didn't go anywhere. So, uh, of course, uh, most of this uh, provision of the, of the protocol is related to mitigation uh, through the joint implementation, emission trading, and clean development mechanism. And uh, later, uh, at the end of 2015, we heard about this ambitious objective to stabilize the temperature uh, up to 2 degrees C in, in 200, in 2000. 100. And many least developed countries are crying for even lower uh, emission in, uh, temperature increase of 1.5 degrees C. So how can forest and water be part of this uh, debate in climate uh, treaty? As you can see in the uh, Article 4, it's related to the uh, nationally determined contribution where all parties are indicating their contribution and um, also the way in reducing emission. It is, it is very clear that in 2015 uh, all parties submitting this uh, document to the Secretariat of the UNFCCC. But uh, in Article 5, it's very clear mitigation uh, option there, which include for us, especially red plus. And to some extent, this uh, article also bring about the issue of adaptation by having mitigation to be jointly implemented with adaptation. But very specifically, in, in Paris Agreement, we can see the, the adaptation provision in Article 7. So I put it in red because uh, I think we, we need to work it out how the issue of forest and water can be brought in into the debate. And interesting enough, throughout the, throughout the agreement, financial mechanism, in addition to the previous one, which uh, consists of uh, global environmental uh, facilities, and then the Spatial Climate Change Fund is already mentioned, but newly invented the Green Climate Fund is there. And more importantly, this me financial mechanism include mitigation and adaptation in a balanced manner. So it's, it's good to uh, know and recognize this, that adaptations got the place in the Paris Agreement. So how, how are we going to, to enter into the debate then? So if you look at the uh, paper that we produce and, and describe in the flyer that was distributed by the committee, we have five uh, bold messages there, actually. One is that forests promote precipitation. This is something which is climatic, climate-related issue, but not related to the treaty. But uh, how can this be part of the debate? Uh, certainly, the scale is different, and then the, the role of forests is very important to uh, play around in, in the context of precipitating uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. So water is being brought about uh, by forests when it is uh, there to promote precipitation. My colleague will be, will be uh, describing this more on the bioprecipitation and the role of vegetation there. Forests and trees are natural cooling system. This is a very interesting fact, especially for urban environment, because uh, the role of, of trees and vegetation are very obvious there in taking, uh, absorbing so much of the energy for transpiring and evaporating water vapor. And that will reduce the amount of energy to heat up the air. So uh, locally or even regionally speaking, it is very important to have forests uh, exist. And then the third message is that the, the process of pumping water, uh, forests will create a 
pressure difference so that water vapor can be pumped across the region, across the landscape, so that the water vapor can be transported and create uh, rainfall elsewhere. So it is very important to have forests to mitigate climate change at the same time also regulate the water cycle. And um, certainly it's very much well known the rule of forest in recharging groundwater, even if, if the forest is, is old enough or even dead, the, the, the macro pores created by root system is a very effective uh, conduit or channel to bring down uh, excessive water in the surface to the groundwater. So uh, if we have this at a large scale, you can imagine the role of forest in keeping the water, regulating the water, and uh, lastly, uh, regulating the flood. And that's that's very important climatic phenomenon. Uh, hydrometeorological uh, disaster is very much related to flooding as well as uh, drought, and forests play a very important role in this. So with all these messages that we have the evidence and pre presented in the paper, we need to bring the issue of water and forest together in, in bundle and uh, through various entry points. Certainly, forest is recognized in the global uh, treaty, but at national level, certainly countries can uh, include forest and water and their circumstances, uh, be it uh, semi-arid or arid region or even tropical region can have these circumstances related to forest and water. And definitely the National Development Agenda is uh, able to accommodate that issue at the same time in many countries. It's very, very appropriate to bring this about. We can also work with the National Focal Point, who are the focal point for the convention. They work very closely with the Secretariat of UNFCCC. Uh, and their subsidiary bodies can be the technical advice as well as the implementation. So there are opportunities and windows where we can work together with the national uh, level uh, to bring the issue of forest and water uh, at the same time. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I would like to uh, conclude my, my uh, talk by uh, thinking about the way forward. That it's not the end of the day, it's not the end of the story that water is not there in the convention. It's not the uh, end point. We, we can always negotiate and work with, with countries at national or subnational level. Of course, the, the objective of this uh, global policy is to reduce emission and and, and, and temperature, but forest and water are very much related to the national agenda. Even if it is not in the global agenda, national agenda will be very much accommodating this. Forests also and trees also significant in uh, making the impact uh, of climate, but also uh, also impacted by climate. So it is very appropriate to, to bring forest issue as well as water in the climate change uh, uh, debate. And lastly, perhaps the, the issue of water security is, is everywhere. Countries are facing this issue very severely and uh, bringing about uh, water at the same time with forests where it is uh, impacted or impacting is, is very appropriate to the adaptation channel that countries can again um, bring in the national agenda as well as submission in the global uh, policies uh, as requested by the convention. So finding the entry point at national level is always uh, providing good opportunity to do that. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Yes. So, oh yeah, I can see David. Hi, David. Good. Hi, I can hear you. Now. Okay, great. So, I would like to introduce the next speaker. It will be Dr. David Ellison from the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. 
And as mentioned earlier, the payment is the uh, the main order for the publications with the uh, other 21 global scientists on this topic. So they will provide you the outlines and also as the introductions of the overall sessions today and uh, tomorrow. Please take it. Floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my presentation is pre-recorded, so I won't talk while it's going, and I'll try not to lip sync. Greetings, and welcome to Cool Insights for a Hot World, a discussion of trees, forests, and water, and their interactions with the hydrologic uh, cycle and climate. This work is largely the product of a Leuven conference that was held more than a year and a half ago. And there were two basic products of this uh, workshop or conference, uh, a policy brief on managing forests for water and for climate cooling published by We Forest, and a science paper that was recently published in Global Environmental Change. Um, I would like to start this discussion with a, an example, a focus on the Nile River Basin. Uh, it comes from the work of one of the co-authors of our science paper. And if you look at the Nile River Basin, you learn that there are at least some 200 million people that depend on the water resources of the Nile River to feed uh, themselves. Um, and because the water is so important, it's also important to recognize that the Blue Nile Basin itself supplies some 85% of the total amount of water that flows to the Lower Nile River. Now, of course, the Blue Nile River Basin area is a much smaller area, uh, but contributes a very, very large share of the water. So, of course, an important question then becomes, what is the source of the Blue Nile waters? Now, if you are a traditional uh, catchment basin hydrologist, you would probably consider the total amount of precipitation that falls in the Blue Nile Basin. And we would observe that precipitation is particularly heavy in the Blue Nile Basin area, area of Ethiopia. And of course, there's much less rainfall in other parts of Ethiopia. But the question I would pose to you is, should we go further than this? Now, <clears throat> some people have uh, gone further, uh, and what you begin to recognize is that the atmospheric moisture, or a very large share of the atmospheric moisture that feeds precipitation in the Blue Nile Basin, actually originates from much further away from the West African rainforest region. And once you recognize that, it's also important to recognize that there is an increasing, increasing amount of deforestation that is going on in this area. If you look at this map, you can see those reddish areas. These are areas uh, of deforestation in uh, the larger Congo region. Uh, some have projected as much as a 25% reduction in rainfall in the Ethiopian highlands with continued deforestation. Now the point here, of course, is that uh, rainfall in one area can be dependent upon the production of atmospheric moisture in other areas, in particular on uh, terrestrial surfaces. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about what I call the concept of hydrologic space. And the general point here is that the traditional focus has always been on the catchment basin. We look at how much precipitation comes in, uh, uses of that water along the way, such as forests and agricultural production, and then other uses uh, downstream, other forms of consumption of the water. But generally, we don't think much about ET once it has actually left, and we stay restricted to the catchment basin. But what we don't try to describe and explain is actually what can, what contributes to that total amount of precipitation. And of course, when you begin to think about it this way, uh, your whole picture uh, begins to change. Upwind sources begin to matter a lot. Of course, there's a large share of oceanic evaporation that contributes to rainfall in uh, most locations 
of the world. But there is also a large share of evapotranspiration coming from terrestrial surfaces. And once we understand that there, the total amount of evapotranspiration from terrestrial surfaces matters, we also begin to recognize that changes in land use practice can influence the total amount of atmospheric moisture production. So conversions away from forest to agriculture or to ur or urbanization have an impact on the total production of atmospheric moisture. And this in turn can have an impact on uh, precipitation. Likewise, within the basin, um, evapotranspiration also occurs. Some of this evapotranspiration gets recycled back to precipitation within the basement, but a very large share of that also goes further downstream outside of the basin and contributes to precipitation in downwind locations. Now what we begin to recognize, of course, is that basins are interconnected one to the next. How water gets transported across terrestrial surfaces is largely a function of land use, uh, land atmosphere interactions. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about this concept of hydrospace. And um, if you take a catchment basin, the initial conditions within the catchment basin and an upwind area, and you can imagine in the impacts of deforestation, so either deforestation of the catchment, deforestation of the upwind area, or deforestation on both regions. And what we would like to be able to say more clearly is that this can impact the total amount of precipitation that falls in the basin, uh, the total runoff that occurs within the basin, uh, and of course also the total amount of atmospheric moisture that leaves the basin once again to become rainfall elsewhere. Likewise, if we afforest the catchment, similar things uh, can be thought about. You, you can think about the impact of afforesting the catchment. You can think about the impact of afforesting the upwind area. You can think about the impact of afforesting both the upwind area and the catchment basin. These changes, modifications of land use practice, once again, can have an impact on the total amount of precipitation that occurs, the total amount of runoff that becomes available, and also on the total amount of atmospheric moisture production that goes further downwind to produce precipitation in other locations. So spatial organization matters. Where forests are located is important. Um, land conversions impact land atmosphere interactions and affect the production of atmospheric moisture overall. Up and downwind interactions matter as much for the water balance or perhaps as much as do up and downstream relationships. Upwind sources of atmospheric moisture production affect both precipitation and the water balance and can or should not be ignored. Likewise, the catchment basin production of atmospheric moisture matters for downwind locations. Now, because spatial organization matters, this has implications for policymaking. Because the supply of atmospheric moisture is transboundary in character, governance structures must consider these larger scale relationships. Most water management frameworks, however, are focused on the local catchment scale. They neglect supply relationships. They do not attempt to consider what explains the total amount of precipitation that's available within a, a catchment basin. Most climate policy frameworks are likewise structured around the international or the national scale. So these governance structures are again, again inadequate to the task they cannot successfully consider larger scale relationships. Regional and continental scale governance structures are rare for catchment basin water management, and where they occur, uh, they typically do not consider the supply or the re-export of, of atmospheric moisture. Finally, the international climate, same, climate policy framework itself is focused on carbon, not on water. Um, but perhaps it should make positive relationships between forests, water, energy, and climate primary. 
It is important to recognize that in our paper we consider a much larger range of forest, water, and energy cycle interactions. So in addition to the transport of moisture across terrestrial surfaces that is provided by forest and vegetation interactions, um, we also look at things like uh, bioprecipitation and the impact of particles from forests that help to create clouds and also then to create rainfall. Cindy will talk about this later today. Um, Douglas will talk about atmospheric transport of moisture and the interaction that is caused by the forest production of evapotranspiration and atmospheric transport cycles. Um, Yan will talk about the impact of forests or um, terrestrial cooling and the consequences of not having uh, adequate forest cover for, on terrestrial surfaces. Um, but I would also like to spend some time talking about fog or cloud forest interception of water from clouds and also a little bit about infiltration and groundwater recharge. Now, with respect to cloud forests, it's important to recognize that high altitude and cloud forests can contribute actually a disproportionate share of the total amount of water uh, that turns into runoff in individual catchment basins. Uh, cloud forests or fog precipitation can be responsible for as much as 2 to 60 percent of the total amount of rain runoff uh, that occurs within individual catchment basins. So cloud forests are capable of essentially stripping the moisture from clouds and contributing a large share of that to total catchment basin runoff. Of course, the important question is, what does this mean for the water towers of the world? How important are cloud forests for the uh, total water balance of individual catchment basins? And perhaps most importantly, what is the consequence of deforestation in these areas? With respect to infiltration and groundwater recharge, uh, Ulrich and Aida have done a lot of work on uh, looking at this dominant paradigm that suggests that if you remove all the forests or vegetation from the surface, uh, you are likely to have the largest amount of groundwater recharge and vice versa. If you increase the amount of forests, um, you have very minimal groundwater recharge and a lot of evapotranspiration. And what they have learned is actually that this story is a lot more complicated. Um, that if you remove all of the forests, you have large amounts of runoff and almost no groundwater recharge because of no the limited amount of infiltration into the soil. Whereas if you have at least a minimal amount of tree cover, you have much greater amounts of groundwater recharge and much lower amounts, levels of uh, runoff. Um, infiltration is improved, of course, by root complexes and the amount of uh, soil evaporation is minimized or reduced by shading from trees. Now, it also seems to be true that if you increase the total amount of forests, that has, once again, the negative impact. It reduces the total amount of groundwater recharge because it raises the total amount of evapotranspiration. This suggests, of course, that there is some ideal level of tree cover uh, which can produce higher amounts of groundwater recharge. Um, this seems to be true for dry landscapes and is presumably true also in other landscapes, but needs to be tested uh, so to conclude, uh, forest cover plays an important role in the regional and continental hydrologic cycle. More forest cover is, generally speaking, a good thing. It can raise precipitation and water availability in downwind locations. However, increasing forest cover in water poor areas can have negative consequences. Having too much forest cover uh, can have negative outcomes. The natural balance of vegetation matters. In addition to down and upstream considerations, it is also important to think about 
down and upwind relationships. However, most assessments of the local water balance fail to do this. Forests represent powerful adaptation tools. In the appropriate surroundings, forests can positively impact atmospheric moisture production, water availability, cooling, rainfall, infiltration, groundwater recharge, and other positive features such as flood moderation and biodiversity, which we talk about a little bit in the paper. Um, and of course, as illustrated by the Blue Nile Basin example, livelihoods depend upon our recognition of the transboundary nature of hydrologic space. Water and energy cycles should be placed at the core of water and land use management and planning strategies. Carbon is secondary, so we would then argue that it is time for a paradigm change. Thank you very much, and I turn the floor to others. And shall we introduce the next speaker? It will be Cindy Morris from the France National Institute for Agricultural Research. Yes, hello, and my talk is pre-recorded, so this it should work. Yes, Cindy. So shall we start the presentation? Okay. I'm Cindy Morris, a microbiologist from France's National Agricultural Research Institute in Avignon. In this short presentation, I am going to talk about how some of the microorganisms that are commonly present on plants might have a role in rainfall that perhaps you had never heard about before. What are the factors that determine when, where, and how much it rains? First of all, the large-scale circulation patterns of the atmosphere create the conditions that make rainfall possible. But the atmosphere is full of particles called aerosols that are also involved in formation of clouds and rainfall. There are numerous natural and anthropogenic sources of aerosols that are regularly emitted into the atmosphere. Aerosols interact with ambient atmospheric conditions and can be decisive in whether rain will occur or not. Depending on their chemical or physical properties, aerosols have different effects on clouds and rain. There are three main types of aerosols that influence the formation of clouds and rain cloud condensation nuclei, giant cloud condensation nuclei, and ice nucleating particles. Cloud condensation nuclei and giant cloud condensation nuclei catalyze the condensation of vapor to liquid cloud droplets. Ice nucleating particles catalyze freezing of cloud droplets to make drops that are heavy enough to fall as rain. Why is catalysis of freezing important for rainfall? You probably learned in introductory physics that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. But in fact, the spontaneous freezing temperature of pure water is minus 39 degrees C. At warmer temperatures, in other words, between zero and minus 39 degrees C, catalysts are needed. These catalysts are called ice nuclei. Therefore, in rain clouds, such as this cumulonimbus cloud, there are not always conditions where spontaneous freezing of water can occur. In the tops of, if the tops of these clouds are warmer than minus 39 degrees C, then freezing of cloud droplets will require catalysts. Freezing will be initiated in the cloud depending on the types and abundance of ice nucleating particles. In order for rain to form in such a cloud, ice particles catalyze the freezing of cloud droplets, then frozen droplets collide with supercooled liquid droplets, leading to the formation of drops that become heavy enough to fall. 
Other processes, such as collision of drops in very turbulent clouds, can also make raindrops form, but at mid and northern latitudes, freezing of cloud droplets is involved in most rainfall events. Other type of rain clouds, such as nimbostratus clouds, are not as tall as cumulonimbus clouds. Therefore, their minimum temperatures are about minus 10 degrees or warmer. For freezing to be set off in these types of clouds, ice nucleating particles that can catalyze ice at rather warm temperatures are needed. What is the nature of ice nucleating particles and what is the range of temperatures at which they can catalyze freezing? This figure represents one of the most recent compilations of data on the freezing activity of the ice nucleating particles naturally found in the atmosphere. The x-axis indicates the temperature at which they can initiate freezing. The y-axis allows us to compare the rate of freezing caused by particles of different shapes, sizes, and nature. To compare the strength of the ice nucleation activity of all these different types of ice nucleating particles, the authors of the, of the study calculated this force in terms of the number of ice nucleating sites per square centimeter surface area of each type of particle. That is what is indicated on the y-axis. Most of the known ice nucleating particles catalyze freezing only when water is cooled to below minus 15 degrees Celsius. These are the mineral and other inorganic particles that are very abundant in the atmosphere. Only certain biological particles, and in particular the bacterium Pseudomonas syringae, can catalyze freezing when water is warmer than minus 15 degrees Celsius. And furthermore, biological ice, nucle ice nucleating particles can incite freezing at temperatures as warm as minus 2 degrees. How do bacteria such as Pseudomonas syringae catalyze ice formation? Like all bacteria, Pseudomonas syringae has proteins in the outer membrane of its cell. One of these proteins has a special affinity for water. This ice nucleation protein binds water molecules, orients and organizes them near the surface of the bacterial cell. This makes the thermodynamic conditions more favorable for ice formation depending on the ambient temperature. This is a very rapid reaction, as you will see in this short film of Pseudomonas syringae inducing ice to form in water that has been cooled to minus 7 degrees Celsius. This water would have remained in the liquid state if we hadn't added the bacterial suspension. The main sources of biological ice nucleating particles in the environment are the microbial communities on plants. The outer surfaces of leaves, for example, are naturally colonized by bacteria and fungi in the same way that our skin has a natural microflora. Healthy leaves can have 10,000 or more bacteria per gram of leaf. Different species of plants harbor different quantities of ice nucleation active bacteria. Therefore, the amount of ice nucleation active bacteria that can be released into the atmosphere from plants depends on the species of plants in the landscape. In fact, most of the known ice nucleation active microorganisms are found on plants, in leaf litter, or in soil. Furthermore, the residues of these organisms, after they die and decompose, can adhere to mineral particles of the soil and maintain their ice nucleation activity. All of these different ice nucleation active microorganisms and the soil particles with debris from these organisms can be wafted up into the atmosphere. 
These different observations have led to the idea that ice nucleation active microorganisms are the key to a feedback cycle between land cover and the atmosphere. This feedback cycle has been called bioprecipitation. In this cycle, microorganisms are lifted into the atmosphere, they incite rainfall through their ice nucleation activity, and are deposited back to the ground with rainfall. The rainfall is favorable for growth of plants and microorganisms, thereby reinforcing the cycle. There is accumulating empirical support for bioprecipitation. Upward flux of ice nucleation active bacteria has been measured. Ice nucleation active bacteria have been found in clouds in several independent studies. In simulated clouds in experimental cloud chambers, ice nucleation active bacteria are able to cause the expected rates of ice formation. Ice nucleation active bacteria are in precipitation as it falls from clouds. The first strains of bacteria to fall with the onset of rain from a cloud are those able to catalyze freezing at the warmest temperatures. This is what you would expect if they were inciting the rain. Just after rainfall, ice nucleation active bacteria multiply rapidly. There is some evidence to indicate that they react more rapidly to rain than the rest of the microbial population on plants. And finally, the amounts of biological ice nucleating particles in the air just above plant canopies also increases with the onset of rain. This suggests that the generation of biological ice nucleating particles that can become aerosols is high when ambient conditions are propitious for rainfall. What are the implications of these observations for the policies and strategies we use to manage plants in agriculture, forestry, and agroforestry in particular? This is a critical question because land use is changing at unprecedented rates, with crops now accounting for at least 50% of vegetated surfaces and over 90% of managed land cover. If we consider the amounts of bacterial aerosols that are emitted from different types of land covers, it is clear that tree culture and other crops are responsible for the vast majority of microbial aerosols. Therefore, the choice of plant species and agronomic or forestry practices could have an important influence on the microorganisms on these plants. Furthermore, the geographic location of these plants could be important to assure that their microorganisms are released into the atmosphere in strategic contexts that have an impact on rainfall. Therefore, to manage crops and forests for their effect on the water cycle is not simply a question of managing plants. It is a question of knowing the microflora of plants and managing them in conjunction with the plants. To prepare this presentation, these are the sources of the images that I used. And if you are interested in obtaining more information, you can consult these links and request to join the BioIce mailing list. Thank you, CD, for your presentation. So for the okay, other I hope participants, uh, we will upload. Yes, CD, can you hear us? Yes, I just hope I just said I hope everyone got the got the video images and heard the sound. <laughs> it's there's a little maybe some technical problems, but it's okay. Yes. Um, if you will upload yes, we got you from Nairobi very clearly. Yes, Cindy. Thanks. Uh, the most important thing was to see how the bacteria induced freezing in that tube, and uh, for me, the video di you didn't see it, but if you want to see it, it's on the list of those websites. Okay. Thank you. So. Let's start the questions and answer. So we are inviting the participants from the room here. 
and also for online participants to type their questions into the chat room. So we have all the speakers ready. Well, um, I can see David the online and also Cindy. So please remember to join the conversations on the hashtag JSRQ using your Twitter and also hashtag Forest H2O. Hi, hi, Ling. Hi, Ling. Yeah, this is Peter. Um, people are asking in the room if they can ask directly as well. Yes, please. Hi, uh, David. This is Michael in Nairobi. Can you hear me? Uh, thanks for your presentation. It was it was really good. Um, one question I had, I, I, I liked your diagram on water recharge and tree cover. Um, something that I'm sort of interested in and been reading on is how uh, groundwater um, in agricultural areas, this has been done mainly in irrigated areas in the United States, can enhance uh, evapotranspiration and actually the coupling uh, between the land surface and the atmosphere. So I was wondering if, if the, um, you could elaborate on that a bit. Can I just uh, get the, the, the main question again? Just the last part. Yeah, so how, um, how groundwater storage can actually enhance the, the coupling strength between the surface and the atmosphere? Should I go ahead and answer right away? Um, uh, certainly if there's no groundwater available or if, there's, if the groundwater table goes lower and lower, uh, there is re a reduced potential for evapotranspiration from any foliage uh, that is there. Um, so the argument from this work would be uh, essentially that you, you need the trees in order to produce the groundwater recharge in the first place. If you take them all away, then you deplete your groundwater recharge, your, your groundwater resources over time because if they're being used for other things, then and there's no recharge, then they're going to disappear. And of course, that would then diminish evap the potential for evapotranspiration. So having that groundwater resource and recharging it through the presence of forests and vegetation, sort of this optimal, optimal amount of uh, forest and vegetation, is crucial uh, to, to that evapotranspiration uh, regime. Of course, once again, having too many forests, too much forest, uh, is in particular in semi-arid environments can produce, once again, the opposite effect. So it's important to recognize that there are limits to this kind of relationship, but there's also a kind of optimal tweaking that is possible. It's unfortunate that uh, Aida and Lua couldn't be here with us to talk about this as well. There's a question. Uh, maybe a question to Cindy. Oh. Um, a part that I think we, we lost a bit in the presentation, but um, I know from seeing your slides, there is this question, these bacteria with all these special properties, are they mostly found in the forest or are they on different plants or, or how about that? Are some trees have more of them than others? Yes. And, and can you tell us a bit about how could we find out? Yeah, there's... Research that we need to that's do right. Them? There's one slide I showed. Can, can you hear me? There's one slide I showed that indicated that different plant species harbor different amounts of these organisms. Uh, for example, something like pine trees do not... I mean, have very few ice nucleating bacteria, very few bacteria in general. Then there's some broadleaf trees that, in fact, do. And basically, we... the your question is really important because I think we don't know because there's probably also an effect of location in the sense that the tree species and the plant species itself can influence the amount of bacteria, but then the location and the climatic conditions can also have an impact. And um, so that I think it would be important to, to look. It's not very complicated to find these things. Um, there's one question that someone typed in about why location of forests matters, and I, I can answer that too, but it's also for David. And so as I said in the end of my work, um, end of my slide, that where the sources of these ice nucleation active bacteria are, are important, because if they're in, in particular, up a forest, up a mountain slope, where you have the formation of orographic clouds, and this is a place where the clouds, everybody's seen this before, the clouds will form up on mountaintops. 
those kind of places where there's uplift and then rapid formation of clouds afterwards could be very beneficial to assure that the clouds are seeded with these organisms naturally through the movement of aerosols. That's why location would matter. If they have to travel very, very long distances to get to a place where it's favorable for cloud formation, they might dilute out, they might dry up. Okay. I, I would also like to respond to this question about why location matters or, or how location matters. Um, probably the easiest way to think about this is imagine you manage a catchment basin and you want more water availability in your catchment basin. And if you go on the simple idea that forest cover is positive for water, you might plant more forests in the catchment basin. But of course, the atmosphere moves, right? So if you plant more forests, they produce evapotranspiration and they take most of it away. So you actually probably would end up with less water in your catchment basin. And that's actually a very standard conventional theory that forests take water away from the catchment basin. We think that's absolutely true, right? So if you really wanted to try to influence precipitation in your catchment basin, how do you do that? You have to do it upwind because what you want is more atmospheric moisture than that then can potentially fall in your catchment basin as rainfall. Uh, so this spatial organization, this idea of location is incredibly important. Right? Uh, you cannot ignore it. So. Thank you, David. Over to Peter. Very yeah. Um, thanks a lot, David. Thanks, Leigh. Um, we have a question online from Paul McLean. Um, and to all of the presenters, actually, that the, the, the focus is on, is on atmospheric water at the moment, but he thinks that groundwater management is also very important for uh, the environment and for the carbon cycle, and this is very much affected by human uh, modifications as well. So he just wants a reaction in, on the relative importance, I guess. Is that clear enough for Daniel, David, and Cindy? Yeah, I would go ahead and just say, I think I've already answered this question more or less uh, in that uh, slide that I did on uh, groundwater recharge potential. Um, of course, groundwater is crucial. I mean, so many societies uh, depend on groundwater for their drinking water or for irrigating agricultural products. Um, and of course, the key takeaway from our from that slide and from what I've been trying to say is that forest cover is crucial to infiltration potential and thus to groundwater recharge. If you remove forests and vegetation cover from the land surface, more water will go off away as runoff or will evaporate from the soil and will never recharge into the ground. Uh, and also the quality of the soil will deteriorate over time, making it easier for water to run across the surface. Uh, the trees and forests are necessary right, for the building of macropores and so on in the soil so that water can infiltrate into the soil. The shade is important because it reduces soil evaporation and allows more water to become available for infiltration and for groundwater recharge. Uh, so uh, the whole idea of groundwater is uh, extremely important. And I think Cindy also would like to add something to this. Yeah, and I think that um, to think of these of groundwater as a distinct thing from atmospheric water maybe is a misconception. David, you might want to correct me, but it's part of a cycle, and so they're not really separate, right? Yeah. I would say that, you know, managing, managing atmospheric water. Absolutely. Certainly. I mean, this, when I was talking about this idea of location before, um, that's really about managing atmospheric moisture. And I think you've also emphasized this idea that atmospheric moisture and the potential for rainfall creation is a function of the kinds of uh, vegetation and in particular forests that you have upwind. So absolutely, this is uh, all of a piece that, that fits together, right? Atmospheric 
moisture availability, uh, potential for groundwater recharge, the, and the types of land uses you have on the land surface, and either the loss or increase of uh, forest cover. Uh, all of these things are linked in and hang together in, in, in tremendously important yeah. Okay, good. I, th I think, thank you. I think, yeah, I think Paul, is, Paul is, um, is quite happy with that. Thank you. Over to you, Leigh. Okay, thank you, Peter. There is a uh, question for Cindy from Emilio de los Rios. So, Emilio asks whether the leaf shape and form are important in atmospheric moisture capture. Over to you, Cindy. Well, I'm not sure I'm the best person. I'm, yes, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that because um, I'm not talking about capturing atmospheric moisture. I'm talking about, you know, uh, releasing it in the air, well, that's evapotranspiration, it's air. But, of course, the leaf shape is important that? Be, it, for that. I mean, just as a botanist, yeah, because it may be better for you. Yes, but Daniela, please. Yeah, Daniela, please. Yeah, Daniela, please. Yeah, Daniela, please. Okay, well, I think the shape of the leaf is not necessarily affecting the capture of moisture, but the entire canopy will be very important, especially when the canopy is wet. So this, what we call broad brush principle in the canopy will be very effectively transpiring or evaporating water when they are wet. But in capturing, um, it depends on the uh, uh, climatic zone, I guess. But in, in transpiring or releasing, uh, they do not uh, actually affect uh, unless we look at it as a broad base, uh, broad brush kind of principle. I hope Emilio happy with that. Over to you. Do you have because aerodynamically trees will be very no lay no no questions from this side at, at the moment. Yes, we have here uh, from here one. Yeah, maybe we can add that both. David and Cindy made it very clear that in water, the location matters quite a lot. The trees and water in one place is not the same as trees and water in another place. Now, Daniel started with the current climate convention expressing things in carbon, and carbon in one place is the same as carbon in another place. Isn't it? So, at the moment, in terms of forest climate, we, we talk about carbon, which is the same. If you measure it in one place, it has the same meaning as when you measure it in another place. And now here with the, for, the water side, we emphasize that the context matters a lot. How, how could that be picked up in the discussions of the climate convention? How different is that in, the, in reality? Maybe for Daniel and David, I think you could reflect on that. Part. Sorry, I didn't get the questions I, properly. I, I think I understand the question. Maybe I can try first, and then Daniel can respond to it afterwards. Uh, so, um, because location matters tremendously, of course, for forests. Sorry, my computer shuts off. I'm back. <laughs> um, uh, so location matters tremendously uh, for forests and the production of atmospheric moisture. And where forests are located in terms of carbon doesn't really matter. But in the general sort of policy framework, it's extremely important to begin thinking about water first, because the forests depend on the water availability in order to be able to uh, sequester carbon. And if you don't think about the water first, then you might end up planting forests in locations that simply can't handle that. And we know that this actually does happen, right? That uh, there is sometimes too much forest cover in locations that are not really well suited to it. 
So in the adaptation planning framework, the idea that water is primary and how forests interact with water is primary needs to be integrated into thinking about the adaptation context overall. Um, and if we fail to do this and we only think about carbon, um, then, then we're in trouble uh, because water is not ever present. Um, um, can you hear me, Daniel? Yes, can minus question, question was that carbon doesn't, carbon doesn't differ from place to place. Carbon is the same from at place A or at place B. But in the case of water, location matters. So you would have to manage it on a location by location basis and in between locations. So um, how do you think, can the climate change convention or the mechanisms that are there uh, manage this kind of complexity in the, in the sense of water? Okay, well, I'll just give you an example or perhaps uh, analogy. When people were trying, when people were trying to do rain making, uh, it is affecting the, the neighbor countries. Um, of course, this will create a lot of problem if countries um, moisture is absorbed by some processes elsewhere. So that will that will create problem. So if if you think about it in a kind of convention or agreement, even at the regional level or even state level, provincial level, they might create problems. So, yes, uh, carbon is mixed uh, readily in the atmosphere, but uh, water vapor or H2O also does it's the same thing. So if it is transported elsewhere, yeah. somebody suffers from it, they might create problems. Yeah. If I can add on to that, Daniel, um, when I in when I was living in Montana, um, the weather comes from the west coast and crosses the states of Washington, Idaho, and then goes to Montana. And the people in Idaho were cloud seeding to capture rain. They were sued by the state of Montana because Montana said that's our rain, and that's a, that's and that was a real situation. And it was in the newspapers and everything. And and it's just a completely complicated situation. Who does the rain belong to? Right. Who yeah. Um, can I just? Um, um, I'd like to add one. I I would like right. to add maybe one more complexity to that. I think it does open up very different things in the sense that within the climate convention, the nation state is the unit that is dealt with, right? And it's not a. As Daniel said, it's a. Re, you can water would have to be a regional arrangement. But in the UNFCC, the party and the principal focus in the analysis is the country so so we we might need, this does need a more complicated arrangement and multi-level kind of thing to be able to deal with in the current architecture maybe has to change perhaps there could be a, an analysis of water budgets based on rainfall of countries before significant deforestation happened and that could be can maybe considered as the rights, you know, the limits of what a country can claim they should be able to. So may I add one question from our audience here? So it can be for all of you. Uh, there is a question. Lay, Lay, David, David, when, when Lay, water... David seems to want to react to something, I think. He wants to add something, I guess. Okay. Or signing off, he's waving his hand. Yes, please, David. Recognize that parties or states have to be ready to be able to work together on these kinds of issues. Um, and there isn't necessarily a mechanism within the UNFCCC convention that encourages or requires them to do that other than for, you know, they're making large general agreements within that framework. So clearly it's important to try to create some kind of a mechanism which encourages parties or states to interact with each other 
uh, on these hydrologic cycle mm. questions and how they are related to land use practices within individual states. But it's a very complicated thing. Um, how do you get people part of to agree to this? How do you set up a framework within which those states can actually cooperate and, and interact with each other? I come back to this transboundary water management framework once again, yeah. uh, right, for large transboundary uh, catchment basins. Those typically only consider the states that are part of the catchment basin, not states that produce the atmospheric moisture. So how do you bring those groups or countries or regions together in order to be able to uh, negotiate and interact with each other? It's not a problem in a place like the United States, which is pretty much one continent as far as water transport is concerned. But for Africa, or for South America, or for Europe, or for the Eurasian continent, uh, these kinds of issues are easy. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, generally aren't even really considered in any kind of discussion framework. So uh, I guess we would argue this has to change, but it's a, an incredibly important question to think about. Uh, and I unfortunately don't have perfect answers for you. I know it's Yes, uh, thank you, David. Can, uh, can you hear me? David? Yes? Okay, uh, there's a yes. final statement from all of you. I think it's also connected clearly with our last question here. So please just emphasize what are the the importance of forest in M3 in the nexus of water, energy, and climate. So I think this is a very uh, relevant question to close the first questions and answer sessions. Please, maybe we can start uh, with you with Pat Daniel, Cindy, and David. Pat Daniel, please. Okay. You already presented that we can use the formal Oh, it is that Pat Daniel has difficulties uh, in hearing the sound here. Yeah, it's okay. Then Daniel can't. Daniel can't hear. So Daniel can't hear. So Daniel, if you can hear me, the question was uh, our reaction about how yeah. forests are important in the water, energy, uh, climate uh, nexus. Right? Is that it? Yeah. Okay. So I'll answer as long as I've got my uh, microphone on. She's asked the three of us, you, I, and David, to answer. So I I would say that well we we've talked very clearly now about water and how it's how it's important for the water cycle, but um, the part about cooling is where the energy aspect comes in, um, and the and the the cooling is in the cooling effect is part of the energy needed for evapotranspiration that is ripped away from the surface and then deposited. Of course, this, this energy as heat is deposited when cloud uh, water condenses. Yes, thank you. I, I, I would just add to this that it's, it's, it's incredibly important to try and think about uh, what is the optimal land use practice that will optimize the use of energy for the, both the production of evapotranspiration and also contribute thereby to terrestrial cooling that will sort of optimize the nexus. Um, and of course the depletion of forests will have a very negative impact on, on all of these cycles. Um, and so one needs to think about what is the optimal uh, tree or forest cover that can optimize this forest water and energy and even agricultural production, food production nexus. Um, uh, we have a long way to go to get there. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So, shall I close the first 
questions and answers patients. And then I will hand over to Peter, Peter Milan from Nairobi. So Peter will facilitate the next sessions with Michael and Arthur and Pauline here. Yeah. So please, Peter. Hi, Ling. Um, we'll, we'll try to get Michael set up so we can start. Um, also, um, just a minute to reconnect the, the, the video from, from our site, and then, and then we'll start, please. Um, in the meantime, um, Michael Marshall is an agroecologist, is one of our scientists here at, at ECRAF HQ. And he'll be talking on evapotranspiration in East Africa as a basis of recycled rainfall elsewhere. So following on from, from uh, um, the other presentations that have been done so far. So we're, we're still waiting for the video to, to, to start running. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, I think we're going to dive into a, a few applications in the next talk, a uh, few talks. and. Uh, the work that we do is uh, in terms of land surface modeling or large-scale hydrologic modeling, land use, land cover change, uh, and how that might affect uh, climate regionally and also over larger distances. So I, I, I think I can claim credit for this talk as just an inspiration. Most of the work was done by my student, John Musau, who's a PhD student at Bangor University. So. What is land use science? Well, land cover, or what's on the land, and land use, how that land is used, uh, changes over space and time. And so basically what we try to understand is how those changes, those conversions, the most famous is probably deforestation, affects uh, climate, in our case, or hydrology. And so this diagram. Uh, basically shows some of the major types of land changes there are. Most of us focus on deforestation, but of course there's also urbanization or irrigation, uh, harvesting, basically removing biomass from the surface, and not only the change, but how much uh, change occurs, the rate, which can all affect the climate. And so how do they affect the climate? By something we call feedbacks. We call them feedbacks because the process actually can enhance itself or diminish itself. And so how does, what are some examples of feedbacks? Well, the most famous is, like I said, deforestation. When you cut trees down, that can increase what we call sensible heat. That's the heat we, we feel. Um, and uh, increase the sensible heat, decrease latent heat or evapotranspiration. And that's the heat Basically, when you sweat, your body cools down, and you feel this cooling effect. That's latent heat. And so when you cut down trees, it actually increases sensible heat, and that can affect the surface temperature, right? So that's a type of feedback process. And there's others, like roughness, right? When trees, as they get taller, they enhance wind, vertical wind, which can increase mixing. So these are all the different processes that we see, how they affect feedbacks. And of course, they have larger implications in terms of the hydrologic cycle, which is intensifying, or greenhouse gas emissions, or snow cover, which I know nothing about. But it's there. So um, there are three major types of ways land cover can affect uh, climate. And the most popular or the most famous is moisture recycling. So this diagram shows you basically uh, the top one, the top panel, the coupling between soil moisture and rainfall, meaning as soil moisture increases, there's more evapotranspiration. That's the moisture that comes from plants in the soil. And that feeds into rainfall. And we see this most strongly, if you can notice on the diagram, in these sort of transition zones, these transitions between the tropics and subtropics. Of course, there's been more work to show that other uh, areas also see this strong coupling. So there's another effect called local coupling. And uh, probably the most famous paper is the uh, rabbit fence. And for those of you who have never been to Australia, the rabbit fence is an area that demarcates very green irrigated agriculture and the very dry interior. And what we notice, actually, is that in these drier areas, there's more sensible heating and more temperature, and that increases convection and rain 
uh, or dryness, sorry, uh, whereas we see in the gr green area there's, there's more evapotranspiration, moisture, and so it feeds onto itself. So this is a type of local coupling. And then we have uh, another type which is uh, due to, like I said, the vertical mixing. So as you increase the roughness of a surface, either with buildings or trees, that actually increases wind and moisture mixing right? and can enhance rainfall. And then as David alluded to in his uh, presentation, uh, one that we're really interested in which hasn't received a lot of funding or interest is this indirect recycling. And so probably one of the most famous cases as uh, David alluded to is we've seen massive deforestation in Central Africa. Uh, we can also see these wind direction arrows showing basically the what we call the West African monsoon. Um, and what we think is is that the forest actually acts as a buffer against moisture loss. So when moisture comes from the Atlantic, um, it buffers the moisture and then that moisture feeds into Ethiopia, the, the fertile part of Ethiopia, the agricultural important area. And so if you cut those trees down, the moisture will actually go down, the buffer, and you can see drying. And so Spracklin and Taylor uh, showed this empirically, um, that deforestation leads to uh, this process. But there's a counter argument too um, by the climate modelers in that if you cut the forests, it will increase temperatures and what we call a dry low at an area that will draw rainfall. But of course, there's always a big feud between modelers and empiricists. So, um, the objectives of our project were basically to assess changes in leaf area index. That's the amount of vegetation on the ground um, and how that might relate to changes in temperature and precipitation or rainfall. And we did this using what we call remote sensing or satellite data and hydrologic modeling, large-scale hydrologic modeling. In this case, what's called VIC, the Variable Infiltration Capacity Model developed at Princeton. We did this over a 30-year period at 8-kilometer resolution. OK, why did we pick East Africa? Well, off the record, it's because we're in East Africa. On the record, it's because East Africa, as you can see in this diagram, um, represents a high mixing ratio, recycling ratio of rainfall, meaning the rainfall that falls is recycled back to the air. It's also an area of extreme land use, land cover change. Um, it's very sensitive to climate variability, droughts, floods, um, also an area of rapid population growth and those pressures that uh, help encourage deforestation, rainland uh, degradation. And of course, the people that live here are highly dependent on rainfall. OK, so the input data is, uh, there were three main sources. The NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, which tells you vegetation abundance. Uh, the Climate Hazards Group, uh, which is a group I used to work with during my PhD. They've developed a rainfall data set. And then, of course, Princeton University, who provided additional input data, temperature, but also the hydrologic model, which has been tuned to East Africa, mm -hmm. thanks to Lee, who's one of our scientists here. OK, so um, this is basically a diagram. You can see a, a highly dynamic uh, vegetation cover in East Africa. The drier regions are dominated by open shrubland, grassland, savanna. Um, you can see some uh, forest still here in Tanzania over much of Uganda, the Lake Victoria Basin. And what this diagram shows is basically the persistence of this land cover, and you can see uh, areas 0.5 and higher show high persistence. So that means that um, these uh, land cover types will probably be there uh, in, the, in the continued future. Okay, so we basically did a trend analysis. And here is the diagram for vegetation abundance, the leaf area index, and precipitation. We didn't see a lot of patterns. Probably the most interesting here is in southern Tanzania, which is a, a forested region, we can see some connection possibly between increased uh, forest cover and uh, decrease in precipitation, which seems uh, rather counterintuitive. So that's something that um, we need to further explore. We would expect more rainfall in areas with increased leaf area index. 
Um, again, these are changes in temperature, maximum, that's like daily temperature, the hottest time of the day, minimum temperature, which is the coldest time of the day, nighttime temperature. And you can see not a lot of trends in uh, daytime temperatures, but nighttime temperatures are quite interesting. We're seeing increases over much of East Africa, particularly in the driest regions. Okay, so this is probably the most important and interesting slide to you. We basically looked at how rainfall and vegetation relate over time. Not just, okay, we have vegetation now, what's the rainfall pattern? We also looked at what we call lags, meaning, okay, it, it rains, so how does the vegetation respond? And what we saw, as uh, a lot of us might expect, these areas in the red represent strong coupling, meaning if you increase vegetation cover, you get more rainfall. So there's this moisture recycling. Now, this is going to lead to a second paper in which we look at how this recycling not only affects East Africa, but how it teleconnects or connects to distant sources. So that gets into the hydro sheds, the precipitation sheds, which we've been talking about. And then another interesting pattern was in the nighttime temperatures, minimum temperatures, and what we see is in areas where vegetation cover has decreased, we see an increase in nighttime temperatures. And the reason we think that is because when you uh, cut down the vegetation or the vegetation gets more sparse, uh, temperatures tend to warm up and because there's more sensible heating. And those temperatures might not have such an effect on the high daytime temperatures, but the nighttime temperatures, because that heat is stored, right? And so you can, you, if you've ever noticed on a really hot day, you, you tend to have a really hot night too, right? And so there's that, that memory that the soil has. Okay, so the major findings, um, basically we did see trends, primarily uh, increasing in forest and uh, agricultural areas and then decreasing trends in shrublands, and there's a lot of evidence to show that is probably due uh, to population pressures, uh, uh, basically to agriculture, pastoral communities. Um, and then probably the most interesting things too, this positive feedback between rainfall and LAI, or vegetation cover, meaning as you increase vegetation cover, you get more rainfall. Um, and then a negative, negative feedback between LAI and temperature, and we say negative because as you uh, decrease the vegetation cover, then the nighttime temperatures increase. So um, uh, this uh, can be found in more detail in Hydrology and Earth System Sciences. It's a, a, um, a really good journal, open access, and the paper was just ex accepted two days ago. And then um, John will be presenting his findings at the uh, European Geophysical Union, which is a large scientific union, uh, this year. So if you have any more questions, you can ask me. But of course, John is really the expert. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Michael. So as usual, please keep your questions. Um, we'll now move on to our next presenter, um, uh, Asta Gebrekistos. Um, Asta will be managing this from her end as well. Um, and we'll try to link her up right away. But Asta is a scientist hello. that is... Hello? Hi, Asta. Hi, Peter. Hi. Go, good. Very good. Um, Asta is a scientist that works with at ECRAF and at Erlangen University, and she's primarily leading a dendrochronology work and linking that to climate change um, in, 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 in a way. So we, we'll ask Asta to just run with, with, with her presentation. So uh, I will talk about uh, three rings, stable isotopes and hydroclimate, and I agree with uh, uh, the previous presenters that, uh, of course, water is uh, more important in the climate change bit, and for all of us, and in fact for the trees also, water is more important than uh, the carbon supply, and that is, uh, there is a lot of things that we need to know. Uh, in my presentation, I will just uh, highlight about the knowledge gaps and research needs and the, the information uh, hidden behind the bark that we uncover using a science called dendrochronology, which is a well-established science in temperate regions. Uh, it has been used for to study 
from cell to landscape and uh, from regional and global scale, but in the tropics, this is a new frontier. And uh, I will, it has, of course, a lot of application. And today, I will focus on hydrology and a little bit of uh, climatology. So, um, dendrochronology, dendrome is, uh, uh, I mean, time sequence and chrono. It's about getting trees. Uh, and uh, basically, we start uh, with uh, collecting samples uh, from dead trees using chainsaw or we don't need to cut the tree. We can use increment cores um, without cutting the trees. So, um, as I said, for the trees also, it's about water. So, it is uh, uh, not only about managing the stomatal conductance, but as you know, trees uptake water by their roots, and the water flows through the basil or through the tracheids into leaves and evaporates via the stomata, right? So when you look at the uh, uh, big uh, circle, which is a vessel, I'm sorry, I cannot show here, but uh, this is um, managing their water uh, need depending on the supply. So at the beginning of the growing season, uh, growing condition is, uh, I mean, favorable, and they can uh, uh, form bigger Phrasal size. Let's say they use bigger straw to to transport water to the leaf and uh, toward the growth of uh, the end of the growth period, they do form small vessels. So that's how we mark the ring boundary. So after marking the ring boundary, we measure uh, the ring widths also uh, because. Trees form wider rings, as you can see here in the slide, during moist years and narrow rings during drought years. So, using this pattern, we can uh, reconstruct what has happened in the past, what's going on today, and we can uh, uh, use this information. And I will show you later in the next uh, slides. So. Uh, Basically, it's not enough to measure just few trees. We measure many trees, and we use a, a cross-dating to uh, establish a pattern. So if the, the uh, arrowing formation and widening formation is, <laughs> is influenced by climate, the pattern would match. So, after doing this, there are a lot of statistical procedures to remove the non-climatic pain due to age and other factors. And please, if you are interested to, to know more about this, uh, watch the video. Uh, it is uh, loaded later. So, uh, also, depending on what you want to know, we measure uh, stable isotopes. We measure the anatomy, we measure ring width, and we measure isotopes from trees. So for isotopes, we use uh, uh, also the trees that we collect for a tree ring analysis, and uh, we use mass spectrometry. It's a lot of process. We collect powder samples, and we extract cellulose, and uh, I, I don't have the time to talk about all this procedure, but I will just show you the uh, um, theory behind it. Trees, they uh, use carbon and water to fix there for photosynthesis. So carbon, it has heavy and light isotope. The heavy isotope, it's slow to move. So it's discriminated at the leaf boundary layer. So the lighter isotope, carbon-12, enters into the, through the stomata. And inside the stomata also, the redispo for photosynthesis, responsible for photosynthesis, discriminates the heavy isotope. So carbon-13 is discriminated by fractionation through diffusion and doing uh, photosynthesis. So here, if the tree is happy, if the climate is favorable, the stomata will be open. So there will be constant in and out of carbon, and carbon-13 will be depleted. So, but if the plant is stressed, the stomata will be closed, and it will, it will fix whatever carbon is inside. 
So it is enriched. So during drought years, carbon-17 is enriched. During moist years, it's depleted. This is the basics. Uh, for, isot for oxygen isotopes, uh, it's also heavy and light. 16O, 18O, and 17. 16O and 18O are more important here. So uh, when we look at here, look at the ocean, it's uh, the, the source, and basically it's zero per meal. But uh, uh, there is a preferential evapotranspiration of the heavy, the light isotope. So water vapor is depleted compared to ocean. And there will be a depletion of the heavy isotope by because the heavy isotope condense uh, uh, faster, and there will be a rain out effect. So you see, the rain is enriched compared to the vapor, and the next vapor is depleted, and the next rain is enriched. We, this we call it the Rayleigh effect. But this is not the only thing. It is modified by latitude. It's modified by altitude. It's also modified by vegetation. So what happens? How do trees modify the cycle? So for the trees, trees they use water, the precipitation water or groundwater. So doing water uptake, there is no fractionation process. There is no separation of this heavy and lighter isotope. So if you measure the groundwater or precipitation water, and the leaf water immediately, or the sap water, is, you would know immediately that where the, the source is. So what happens is the fractionation happens at the leaf level. <coughs> I'm sorry. So at the leaf level, there is evapotranspiration demand. And the lighter isotopes, they transpire faster because they are quick and there will be enrichment of the heavy isotope. And there are a lot of biochemical processes. I'm not going to go in detail into that. But what's important here is the origin of water is important, the altitude, latitude, and the temperature. So during drought years, uh, there will be high enrichment of uh, the H&O. And during wet condition, conditions, there will be depletion of the H&O. So this is the important thing that you have to remember. So. Uh, Based on these different parameters, as I showed you, we can use anatomical structure, we can use tree rings, and we can use isotopes, and they can tell us a lot of things about past climate, about hydrology, about uh, what has happened, what's going on today, and uh, the impact of CO2 in the atmosphere. So this is a work done by uh, PhD student Mulgeta. He is, this is the longest chronology established in East West Africa. This is 200 years of rainfall reconstructed from using junipers from uh, um, Ethiopia, uh, basically the Upper Blue Nile River. It meant, and as you can see here, there are drought events also uh, before in the 1980s, 1990s, and the 1985 drought is more severe. So this information is critical if you want to. Uh, um, no uh, separate, uh, you know, the impact of climate change and climate variability. And we can also use this uh, chronology to reconstruct stream flow to manage water. So here uh, in the recent years, drought frequency is increasing. Before it was about six, seven years drought, but now Drought is happening every two to three years. And this is related to El Nino. And the importance of this chronology is not only local. It has wide regional implication. As you can see, the spatial correlation, spatial coherence over large distance here around the Sahel Bay. So it's correlated positively with rainfall, as expected, and negatively with uh, uh, I mean, temperature. And this is the uh, influence of the South Africa monsoon here. And uh, my note about teleconnection. And this is uh, evidence that, that uh, you know, there is a precipitation movement from one place 
and it's aspirin. So, <coughs> similarly, we use clearings in West Africa to reconstruct uh, climate. And you see here from clearings, this big depression is the long Sahel drought. And Michael thought, talked about remote sensing. Remote sensing are also very good proxy. And they are fitting nicely with carbon 13 and because negatively, of course, if it's green, if there is rain and there is depletion of carbon 13. And this is nicely. But the point here is that, okay, if you look at only this trend, we would assume that the Sahel is getting wet or getting green. But when you look back in time, in the 1920s and so 1940s, there were also moist periodic events. So this shows that, um, so when you look at the trend, there is no trend. It's only periodic events of moist and drought years. So this shows that the importance of having a long-term climate data. Asta, can you can you speed up a little bit? The other point is, Hi, Asta, can you speed up a little bit? Yeah, the other point. <coughs> okay. I'm, I'm, the other point is on. Uh, yeah, hello, can you hello? Peter? Yes, we can hear you. I was just asking if you can speed up a little bit, please. Yeah, and put on your camera, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the other. Okay. The other point is here, you see, we also measured oxygen isotope. It shows drought events in the, during the Sahel, drought event here, and the species difference. Some species they are using, so recycling the precipitation water like sclerocarabiria, which is enriched compared to anagis leucarpus. But the other one is using deeper water sources and this is also, I mean, contributing to evapotranspiration. So the trees are modifying the water cycle by using different water sources of precipitation and groundwater. The other point here is that you see there is no trend in the species that use groundwater, but there is a trend in the species that use soil water because of high evapotranspiration demand. And this, as you know, that climate temperature is increasing. And this is a proof. So it's important to know also what is it's water is location specific. It's not like carbon. And it is also coherent, uh, what we measure in Kina Faso, it is coherent along the sand belt. So it tells us about source of water, it tells us about climate and the physiological processes of different species that we can also tap in for restoration and uh, when we talk about tree planting, what plant and what not. So the other is from China. You know, in China, they are converting their natural forests into plantations, and we wanted to see what are the implications in the water relations. So basically, both are pine trees. One is pine, exotic pine, Kisia, and the other is pine of Armandi. So in the pine, in the exotic plant species, and we separated the early growth uh, part and the lead wood part because, as I said, oxygen tells us about the source of water. I, so, uh, is the source different? I asked. Is the natural forest? Asked, see, can, you, can you can you please uh, wrap up? I'm really sorry. Time is is running out. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so, so you see, so it is in the forest there is cloud formation and during the lead part they are using recycled water, precipitate re precipitation water. So. This is the difference between exotic and the cloud forest and the importance in the water cycle. Other is water is, CO2 is increasing and this is changing the intrinsic water efficiency. And if the species, you see they are increasing, intrinsic water efficiency is increasing. What is the implication for the water cycle? If this is happening due to summer project, that means less water vapor is coming to the atmosphere and this, this is going to change the water dynamics. It's important to know what are the potential thresholds, what are the longer spatial and temporal scales. In tropics, we don't know. So this is what I want to say. There are a lot of implications in restoration. There's a lot of climate in the hydrology and uh, carbon cycle. So 
it is time to uh, look behind the map to make evidence-based policy decisions. I'm sorry, uh, uh, I have to rush and uh, yeah. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks, thanks. Thanks, Asta. Sorry for rushing you. Just, just worried about time. Thank you so very much. Very interesting. Uh, we'd like to remind people, can you please uh, keep on the conversation in terms of your question on the trees uh, uh, are cool uh, hashtag, please, so that we can come back to those questions at the end of our third presentation. Um, Lei, can you maybe take over on Miner's presentation from your end? <laughs> Yes, speaker. Thank you very much. So our next speaker, he will challenge the concept of blue water. There are water that is blue, water allocations. There are water that is gray or waste water treatment. And there is also green water or the water used by fast-growing trees. However, our chief science advisor, Professor Dr. Maina van Rootwijk, from a uh, World Agro Center, and also he is a, le a senior lecturer, a professor from the Bahamian University in the Netherlands. He will present about the rainbow water. Please stop for your rainbow colorful presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we're still needing a little setup that I can actually move the slides, but um, I'm happy to, to be the last speaker of the today's part of it and try to wrap up what we have seen so far. And you've seen the diagram that we use here in the announcement of this meeting. So we have these funny colored, funny colored clouds with rainbow colors on it, and which are the source of rainfall which comes onto the land. And from the land we get water into rivers and lakes and we get water that is used locally and becomes groundwater and it can be used as a local park. Now, um, in most of the discussions of hydrology, they only start to look at water once it is in the river or in the lake. So most of hydrology is blue water hydrology. And it took quite a while before people understood that what the trees are doing with water, maybe 60% of the water actually stays in the soil and is used by vegetation on average. There is more green water than there is blue water in that sense, and that the traditional concerns over water shortage in the world were limited to the blue water part of the story. But as we've heard also from, from David and in many ways, and there's still more to it than that, because uh, it is not, we cannot take rainfall as a given. Ra rainfall is not, well, in Africa, it depends on the rainmaker or it is given by God or whatever external variable we have. No, we start to understand that rain comes out of the clouds and that we can try to understand where the clouds come from and what happens. So, in my talk, I will talk about that rainbow water, so the, the water vapor in the atmosphere, and we have this concept of the teleconnections. Now, teleconnections is a, a bit complex word that I'll explain it later. Um, a lot of the stuff in my talk is, is in this policy brief that we developed after the Leuven meeting and also released in Paris. And it is this story of a certain piece of land uh, has its, its cycle at the same time that passes on the clouds to the next area. If another, the neighboring area does not have forest, it will get a lot of rainfall that will yeah. all end up in the river. But the neighbor behind it will have nothing left. Yeah. So we have these teleconnections, we have the, the cycle in which things are passed on in terms of, of the atmospheric moisture as well as the, the river water. Yeah, so we have these two words, the, the rainbow water here points to we need to look at the whole cycle and, and you've heard that many times before this afternoon and, but, and we can describe that as, as the blue, the green and the rainbow water and the data connections points to there are effects at distance. Yeah, so we're very used to effects local but data connections mean if you do something here it influences not only your direct neighbor, but maybe influence somewhere outside. And as we've seen in the earlier debate, that brings that whole issue of rights. Who has the right to disturb their neighbors? How well, we make rules about that? 
but who has the right to disturb somebody a bit further away that is the teleconnection issue yeah so we see if we look at these colors of the of the hydrological cycle the blue the green the gray and the rainbow we see that rainbow is about atmospheric moisture green is about plant and soil blue is about rivers and lake and gray is about recycled waste now we can see teleconnections in all of these there's teleconnections on gray if i pollute the water in the river and the downstream neighbor has polluted water if i change the buffering I, I may cause floods somewhere else. If I use all the water for my tree plantation, there may be droughts elsewhere. So three of these data connections, they, they operate within the watershed. And we've had many rules and regulations and policy and conflict and wars about those aspects of water so far. But we now start to understand that the, the further data connection is about rainfall. Yeah? And if the politicians could decide on the rainfall, well, it would be a terrible discussion. It would never agree on that. If we start to see that the rainfall this country has depends on what the neighbor has done, that can lead to many conflicts and many, many bad things at the same time. And it could lead to agreement if, if we start to understand what it actually is and that it is something we need. We have this common but differentiated responsibility language in the Climate Convention that gets new meanings when we start to understand the teleconnections in, in rainbow water. Yeah, so we see here this point of the, the fully vegetated chunk of land in which rain is falling, but also contributed back to the atmosphere with a moderate amount of river flow. And if we would remove the trees, uh, we would get a precipitation, but it would all come into the river, and we would have much less passed on to the, the, down, the downwind neighbors. Now, I'm going to show you a rather famous diagram by a Dutch artist called Escher of a waterfall. And there has always been this debate. Uh, it's showing a perpetual mobility. It suggests that water keeps flowing by itself. And, and from high school physics, you know that perpetual mobilities don't exist. Well, perpetual do exist as long as we have solar energy driving it. But um, within this drawing, please pay close attention to what happens here at this point. Yeah? Because what we see in this Escher diagram is two cycles of water. And there is the what we call the short cycle, where water comes from the land and goes back to land. And we have the long cycle. If you take two steps, then you go back to the oceans, and you come back from the oceans back to the land. So we have this perpetual mobility of our water the hydrological cycle, which is driven by the solar energy. And, and, okay, I need to click at the right place. That easy? Yeah. And we, and we can see that, that that rainbow recycling is the short cycle, and that, that water spilling over after one turn back into rainfall, and the rest of the water comes back to the oceans, and that is the long cycle. Now, there has been a lot of debate in the literature what percentage of the rainfall in the world is short cycle rain versus long cycle rain. There was a time that we said it was only 10% short cycle and 90%. Oh, and now we think it is between 40 and 60% is short cycle rain. At the same time, it matters a lot where we are. There's some interesting concept now of the, um, well, these are some key papers by Ruth van der Ent, and who worked on the, the origin and fate of atmospheric moisture. You see the dominant pattern of how air moves depends on how the planet is turning. And, and that we can combine that with measurements of atmospheric moisture and calculate back how much of the rainfall is recycled versus how much is primarily coming from, from oceans. Yeah, and that has led to these two key figures. So Actually, the thesis of Ruth had the same Escher diagram, but I, I, I missed the point of the short cycle. Now, the upper diagram shows it in different colors. What part of the rainfall on a given place is dependent on recycled water? So if you see the reddish colors, that means places their rainfall depends on neighbors on land. If it is blue or green, then 
the rainfall depends on oceans and El Nino and ocean tempers or whatever. The second map is equally interesting. It tells us if <coughs> a unit of water goes back to the atmosphere from where you are, if it is red, <coughs> then almost certainly that atmospheric moisture will come back as rainfall over land. If it is blue, then it will go back to the oceans. Yeah? So we see <coughs> basically source areas and sink areas of terrestrial recycled water in this map. And we'll come back to points of that. If the slide would like to move. Thank you. Um, the slide doesn't move. Yes, okay. Now, if we, we zoom in on that map, then then we, we have two of our previous talks about what happened in East Africa and the rainfall in Ethiopia. According to this type of information, and, and it depends partly on the time of year that you look at, but the dominant flow of atmospheric moisture into East Africa comes from the Indian Ocean, and it finds its way over East Africa and then bends along to come into to Ethiopia. At the same time, there is, in other parts of the year, water coming from the, or moisture coming from the Atlantic Ocean. So we have two different sources on that. Now, interesting thing, the River Nile we talked about before, the River Nile actually connects, it's in two different teleconnections part. In, towards South, South Sudan, Uganda, all the evaporation <coughs> that happens there will find its way to become rainfall in the Sahel. So it may be water that first fell in, in, in Kenya and then went to Lake Victoria and then evaporated. And if it evaporates in, in White Nile, it will come back as rainfall in West Africa. If it finds its way all the way up to Egypt, then evaporation from Egypt will find its way towards India and ultimately towards China. Yeah? So if we start moving around water in the Nile and we get more water from the White Nile as irrigation water in Egypt, like the Jonglai Canal has been trying to do, we start shifting rainfall from Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger towards rainfall in China. Now, if we would fully understand that, then the politics and the debate about that will be very substantial. Um, but I think we should not play ostrich on here. If, if we start to understand it, we need to bring up the complexities of it into the geopolitical frame. Now, within that overall map of the sink and source areas, there are three specific teleconnections that are worth discussing a bit further today. The first is, on the left side, we see the Amazon. And it is well known that the Amazon gets its water from the Atlantic Ocean, and there is several types of recycling going on within the Amazon, and ultimately waterfalls on the Andes Mountains. At the same time, the, the areas that primarily depend on terrestrial rainfall are in northwest Argentina and neighboring countries out there. So if there's major change in the forest in the tree garden in the Amazon, it is likely to have major impact on rainfall in neighboring countries like Argentina and Paraguay. The second part focuses on the African teleconnection, and that's still a bit complex. I mean, it's very clear that Sahel and Ethiopia are on the receiving end, so a lot of their rainfall depends on rainfall evaporation elsewhere in Africa. But according to the, the source I use here, most of that Ethiopian water has come through the East African route, with other versions that have more of it entering through the, the Congo Basin route. And I think there's still a further debate on the details of that. But it is clear that in important parts of Africa where a lot of people live and where they're very much dependent on rainfall, their rainfall is recycled and depends on the government elsewhere. On the Asian side, there is a very interesting teleconnection where we see that most of the rainfall in China is recycled rain. An important area where that rainfall comes from is Myanmar and mainland Southeast Asia. So as we currently happening major uh, changes in the forest and the forest cover in Myanmar, uh, we can easily predict that it will have effects and implications yeah. for the rainfall in China. Um, and that's a very different type of relationship in the climate than we've currently seen in the 
international climate negotiations where emissions anywhere in the world seem to be similar um, and mitigation anywhere in the world is similar. We have a strong geographic connection here. So uh, David Allison mentioned that point that we, it, it's beyond the watershed. Well, we have the terminology for that now that is the precipitation shed. Yeah, the watershed is all the land area that contributes water to a river. The precipitation shed is all the land plus ocean that contributes water vapor that will become rain in any specific place. And that's a useful concept. So the, the geopolitics is about the precipitation shed. And so far we have watershed management as an established discipline. We don't have precipitation shed management yet. But our story here is that this is the type of thing we would need if we take this stuff serious. Yeah? So in a little more technical sense, the, the key balance equation is still that river flow equals the precipitation minus the evapotranspiration plus or minus the buffering that happens in the soil. But so far we've seen that as given rainfall and now we start to understand that precipitation itself is part of the cycle and that we shouldn't see it as this is what happens given the rain. No, the rain itself is the feedback process from other things that we described. And this is one attempt to summarize what we know. We know trees are using a lot of water. By doing that, they recycle water in the atmosphere. By doing that, they cool. There's a direct link between the cooling effect and the water use. And at the same time, trees modify the soil to make the soil a more effective buffer. But on one hand, immediate, and we'll see tomorrow more detailed stories, the direct cooling effect is directly linked to that. At the same time, that water loss is not water loss, but is recycling. And our current policies see it as a loss and we need to understand what recycling means. Yeah, so traditionally, we look in hydrology at the patch of land where that all happens. That patch of land is part of a, of a catchment that things are connecting the natural flows. This is the version of the diagram that David was probably looking for. And in the parklands of the Sahel, we see that we have two contradicting forces. On one hand, trees use more water than other vegetation. On the other hand, trees create the infiltration into the soil that allows water to infiltrate. And in the parklands, the traditional agroforest systems of the Sahel seem to be optimal in terms of groundwater infiltration. If we would increase the tree density beyond what farmers have developed, we would have less groundwater. If we remove the trees, then we get runoff and we get erosion and all the things that come with it. So it's quite a delicate balance. Yeah. Now, the, the, the story about forests and floods deserves a separate symposium, and it's a long-standing discussion, but in some work that is, is currently being published, um, we have seen that on one hand you see the link between vulnerability of people and what happens in the forest, there are many steps in between, but, but the, the bottom line is there is a consistent way to describe that buffering, there's a consistent way to see that if you shift from forest to mosaic landscape to have open landscape, you lose some of that buffering and you do increase the risk of extreme events, extreme rain events being translated. And what we see here is a bit complex diagram, but we see a link between the upper part, which is the, the atmospheric hydroclimate, the type of the tree and the tree stomata, the level that Buster talked about with water versus carbon exchange. <coughs> we see the tree and the soil interacting with the storage and the infiltration. <coughs> and we see the whole story of what happens in blue water and how much can be used for irrigation and for domestic use. Now, the ecosystem services framework actually is quite comprehensive and that allows us to talk about all these different functions of the water cycle as being part of the ecosystem services. At the same time, within ecosystem services, we have trade-offs between provisioning and regulating services. And we need we can try to take this into the debate about to what extent local land use influences the neighbors, the faraway neighbors and the people within the same precipitation shed. Yeah, and, and then we see that yeah, uh, the, the dominant discussion about rainfall is linking it with El Niño-La Niña cycles, so temperature in the ocean translates into water vapor that influences 
either too much rain or too little rain on the land. That is the, the long cycle. At the same time, by and large, 40% of rainfall is that terrestrial recycled part. And within that, we can define ecosystem services as returning clean water to the river, an ecosystem services returning water vapor to the atmosphere, and an ecosystem services in, in reducing pollution and dealing with it that way. Yeah. But the, the key challenge then, and this is my last slide, is that where so far the, <coughs> the climate convention has divided their issues into two parts. There is issues about mitigation, reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, and there's issues of adaptation, learning to live with the climate that is changing. We really are not actually comfortable with either part of it. Yeah? And although water is a dominant greenhouse gas, it is not part of mitigation. At the same time, we're not really talking about adaptation. We're not about learning to live with the changing climate. We're actually about changing the climate. We're actually about modifying the temperature, the humidity, and the things that matter for most people. But, so, but if we have only this choice of mitigation, adaptation, then the debate that we have now is, is more easily framed within the adaptation part of that story. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, we say the, 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 the hydroclimate, all the things about clouds and rainfall, whatever, and the albedo, the reflections of energy that depends on the land cover, they actually matter a lot for climate. And current climate models are gradually getting better in incorporating all these other aspects of it. And at the same time, and we'll get back in that tomorrow, whenever we meet farmers, whenever we meet anyone, whenever we meet someone living in the city, um, it's very clear to everybody that trees provide shade, that trees change the temperature, that you want trees in order to make the climate what you want. And so far, we have to, to tell people, yes, there is this carbon thing, and you have to measure this and that, and it's a long story, and it's quite abstract. If we can start with the local knowledge, if we can start with the local concerns, if we can start from what people know about trees in terms of modifiers of, of humidity, temperature, and the story is so much easier. Yeah? We have a difficult route ahead with the common but differentiated responsibility between countries when we start to realize that what one person does influences the rainfall somewhere else. It's very difficult at that level, <coughs> but at least at the the farmer level, I think if we tell this story in terms of water, uh, we connect much more readily to the concepts that people have, the concerns that people have, and the direct right. benefits that people can see mm -hmm. from having the right trees in the right place at the right amount. That's my last part so far, and, and I, I hope tomorrow we'll hear more detail on the temperature part. I will take it more into that discussion with reforest if you actually want to mm. interact with restoration in landscape, what does it mean? <coughs> I will take it further back into the discussion of um, global climate and all the water policies at the high level. But the main story so far, there is a missing middle. Yeah? We don't have institutions that relate Myanmar and China in terms of rainfall. We don't have institutions within Africa that link what happened to East Africa, to the rainfall in Ethiopia, and, and through that to Egypt, and all the Nile water they had, and through that to all the whatever. Yeah? So that, that's a scale that is relevant in the biophysical understanding of the world that is currently not represented in the institutional part. And I think that that is the main challenge that we identify going from the biophysical understanding of how things actually work towards these are the implications of the current policy. Thank you. So thank you, Pamela. So after these three presenters, uh, we can start the questions and answer session. For the online participants, please post your questions into the chat room. Okay, uh, let me start with uh, the first question from our audience here, from Ahmad Solihin. So the question is to Esther. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. 
So let me start the question for after. So how the anatomy of wood can define the prior events such as climate change and water shortage or crisis? And how do you think it differs between climate region? Like for example, tropical versus temperate. Yes, I will hand over to you after this answer. How the anatomy of wood can define the prior events such as climate change and water shortage or crisis? And how it differs from Climate regions, for so example, tropical versus temperate region. Okay. So, I mean, um, the anatomy of the wood. Yes, please. Is uh, as I showed, it shows different cell size depending on the availability of water. Large vessel size and smaller vessel size. Um, so during when there is a lot of water, it forms bigger size. So this pattern can be measured, anatomy. But more easily, it is on the ring weeds. Yeah, it is wider ring during moist years. It's narrow ring during drought years. So we can use the anatomy by measuring the basal size, by looking at the distribution. Uh, it's a new, actually, tool, and it can be used for, for example, to compare the um, reaction of different species to drought, for xylem cavitation and immobilism. There is a lot of things ca that can be done. And uh, it is different from region to region. In temperate regions, it's easy because they have this distinct climate variability like winter and summer, but in the tropics it's complicated. There are trees that form rings, but there are also ringless trees. But the isotopes can also be used for species that, that, don't, that they don't form rings. We can use the isotope to mark the ring boundary and to look at what has happened in the past. So it's different, but it's possible in both regions and uh, yeah, we can reconstruct what has the climate change on the anatomy, on the ring weeds, and on the different uh, isotopes on carbon and oxygen. I don't know if, is it clear? Yes, after, I'm not an expert on this. However, I can conclude that it is uh, the anatomy of trees can provide information of uh, different changes, and it's kind of difficult. Depending if there is drought years, the cell size will be small. So that is how they change in each year. Seasonal and uh, interannual, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Esther. Uh, when I go to Peter, um, Peter, yes, we can, can hear you, hear you. We can hear you now. Or yes, any... we can hear you now. Can you hear us? Okay. Um, we have one question from Do the floor. Can you please yes, ask please. a question, please? Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation from the team. Well, here in Nairobi, we are directing this question to Asta. Uh, yeah, um, Steve Diguna from yeah. KFIS. Yeah, I hear you. And I'm directing this question to to Asta, Asta Ikraf, and then University. In regards to isotopes and radiation, one question is, how, how does the cosmic radiation affect the growth of sprouse trees and the ring inside them? And the next question is, does cosmic radiation have positive effects for the healthy growth of plants, and in which way? Thank you. Um, actually, my my talk on, can I start answering? Yeah, this um, the isotopes that yeah. I talked about, the oxygen and carbon. They are kind of fingerprints, let's say like that. They are stable, and they are not affecting the plant growth. It's the climate that's affecting the plant growth. 
But this isotopes fractionate depending on the climate variability and the physiology of the fish species. So, I mean, of course, radiation has its impact, but you can, I cannot uh, tell about three health using uh, the carbon and, uh, and, and oxygen isotopes. It's, it's about the physiological processes, water sources, and climate impact. So I'm not sure if if I answer your question. It's not radioactive thing, this one. It's a stable. Radioactive is decayed with time. It has its impact, that's like carbon-14 and the other isotopes. But these are stable isotopes. Okay. Um, we have one question online from uh, uh, you, um, um, on, and the question is from Michael. And the question goes, um, in the slide, vegetation precipitation feedback, you model the lag effect of vegetation. Could you talk about what's the intuition behind modeling temporal effect? Sure. So um, probably the, the most famous case um, uh, is uh, the relationship between NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. This is a remote sensing index that responds to vegetation abundance or greenness. Um, there's quite a few studies that show um, that there's a, a lag effect in that uh, you have rainfall and then the vegetation responds. And that could happen over two or three, three months. Um, so it's important to consider these effects because rainfall recycling, for example, might happen over shorter periods of time. But how vegetation responds to temperature or rainfall might happen over longer periods. Yes, we have one more question from Ermias from the floor. So maybe he will go with that, and then we can come back to the online questions. Thanks. Good. Ermias, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ermias, and then my question okay. is mainly directed to Michael, and then also, of course, mine and then Aster also could give their comment. I think my view is that when you talk about land cover change, forest change, we often attribute it to, you know, anthropogenic causes. But these days, there are also, you know, like drought-induced, you know, natural causes of tree mortality, tree dieback, which also again affect, you know, the ecosystem services we would expect from trees and forests. So I would like to see your views and you know, what's going to happen, I mean, in the years to come, because climate change and drought is also again affecting them, and then they may not be a cure also, they might be also a victims. And I would like to see your views on that. Thanks. I, I guess I'll answer first. Uh, so what we know is that the hydrologic cycle is intensifying. And so the bad news for dry areas is generally they're going to get drier, and the wet areas are going to get wetter. And so I think in any proposal I write or, or paper, I always encourage uh, tree growth as a climate buffer because uh, not, not only can it uh, enhance rainfall, uh, rainbow water, um, it, it's also an alternate source of nutrition and income whether you're in a drought or a, uh, a wet year. Yeah, I I mean, I and agree with uh, uh, Elia that uh, trees are dying, tree mortality <coughs> is increasing, and there is a lot of, I mean, uh, uh, study going on globally. And uh, I think it's very important to to focus on the adaptation of tree species to these different drought events and the impact on the hydrology and uh, carbon cycle. So I, yeah, especially on this uh, global initiatives on, on reforestation, so, yeah. <coughs> we need, we need to, 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 to know more about this. Yeah, if I, if I can add to it, I, I think we've so far focused on the, the spatial scales between the local and the regional, but of course in terms of time, we also deal with very different processes, yeah? and. and all the emphasis so far on infiltration is that infiltration does not depend on the current tree as much as it depends on the previous trees and on the old tree root channels and the stuff that creates macropores in the soil and it interacts with the earthworms and the soil biota that creates macroporosity. But you easily you can degrade within a few years, but to rebuild takes five to ten years. Yeah? So if we, where we see tree mortality 
the current species are no longer adapted to it. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of soil, it takes maybe five years before you see the full negative effect on that. And then uh, the vegetation is trying to recover on that. So the short-term effect of cutting trees uh, in many cases is positive because we still have the tree, the soil structure. And the longer term, we see that degradation. And the combination of the temporal scaling and the spatial scaling makes it very difficult to deal with. And anyone who wants to say, uh, we want performance-based policy and we want to measure the water before we, we need it. No, uh, sorry. The variable climates and the type of time frames that we deal with here, and if we don't believe it until we've seen it, they were definitely too late to, to deal with it. Yeah, so this, this question, do we trust reasonable inference, reasonable models on what is wise way to handle the land? Um, and in the carbon we went to, no, we can measure it and we can have performance-based payments. I think here with water, we, we, no, we need to try to manage land in a proper way, have metrics on that, but we cannot go that full route of fully evidence and performance-based things. We need to manage land in a proper way with reasonable outcomes and, and be happy with that because of the uncertainty in time and space. Yes, thank you, Pamela. I think it's related to your last statement um, about the performance-based indicator. There is a question from Ahmad Salihin here, a student from IPD. So he said that he got a lecture from his lecturer that water is not part of greenhouse gas. And for sure, it is not counted in the UNFCC debate, which is only CO2, CH4, and so on. Do you think it should be included? Well, um, maybe Daniel, if he's still uh, awake, could comment on that as well. And of course, that depends on how you define greenhouse gases. But it is very clear that water vapor no, 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 no. in the atmosphere has a strong greenhouse gas effect. No. That it deflects radiation and it keeps the, the long wave radiation inside, etc. So clouds and water vapor are the number one gas vapor in the atmosphere that mother, that translates solar radiation into temperatures. At the same time, when the whole debate on greenhouse gases started, the argument was that uh, water vapor has a short lifetime in the atmosphere. It goes in and it goes out. And, and the assumption was that by and large it would not be changing. Yeah? Whereas if you look at CO2, or methane or nitrous oxide, they have that greenhouse gas effect. And at the same time, they reside in the atmosphere for yeah, many, many years. And, and the policy is based on we need to mitigate now because there's this build-up, etc. So water vapor does not have that long-term accumulating effect like methane or nitrous oxide. But it has by far the most direct effect of temperature in what is the greenhouse gas effect in the, the physical sense per se. Yeah? So it has not been part of the, the UNFCCC debate, but uh, it has the most immediate and direct effect of the weather and the climate that all of us perceive. But that's very interesting work of some of the co-authors on this paper of recent. Uh, we know crowds tend to associate with forest. Uh, there was a big event in France, wiping out part of the forest, and, and they could see for several years it, the pattern of clouds in that area was changing quite a bit around it until the forest grew and there was a recovery of that plant. Yeah, So thinking of clouds as greenhouse gardening actually helps with understanding of it. At the same time, it is not part of the current agreed greenhouse gas accounting that, that we see. Yeah, I, I hope that clarifies the two sides of it. Nodding, so. Yes, we can see some, uh, some of the audience here are nodding, so you need to hear that. So let me hand over yes, to um, Peter. Thanks, Peter, Lee. You have um, some um, I think Cindy has Peter. raised a very, some very interesting um, suggestions oh, okay. here that are, that are really good for all of the, the presenters to look at. Even I, I think also Daniel and, and uh, David, uh, if they are still available, I think um, she said, could we make a map of regions 
corresponding to precipitation sheds or other divisions that would be appropriate for messaging the, managing the water cycle? Could we name each region as if they were states and create a tool that would be provocative but also useful to set up the inter-institutional infrastructure that Miner suggested at the end of his talk? I, I don't know how long that is, but I, I think the, the whole idea is could we begin to look at those sort of precipitation, you know, sheds and, and look at regional implications and things like that. So I think maybe Miner, then David, um, and then maybe everyone else. Yeah, and the person who has introduced that terminology and published most of it about this is Patrick Keyes, who I believe he's student at that point in time. And of course, the problem with precipitation shed is where do you stop? And because ultimately the whole world is the precipitation shed of any place on Earth. And we can be pretty sure that there's no water vapor escaping to the moon or coming back from the moon. So it is somehow within planet Earth that all points on Earth are connected to all others. Same time, if you put a limit and say, well, I want to know where 95% of the water vapor comes from. Yes, then we can draw the lines on the map. Or I want 90% or 98% or 99%. So in, in the work of Patrick, uh, he, he presents those type of maps and examples. At the same time, I think what we've seen here, um, for example, focusing our thing on the Nile Basin, we see that, well, if, if the, the water, the rainfall in Ethiopia comes in at, from the Indian Ocean over, the, over Kenya and then it goes to Uganda and it evaporates there and it, it evaporates through the atmosphere, it goes back to Ethiopia, it falls into the blue now, watershed that goes down to Egypt, and in Egypt it's used for irrigation water, and that irrigation water ends up evaporating and, and flowing back to India, and never back to the Indian Ocean. Yeah, so it, it is um, a nice concept, but it, there is no single way to draw a line, and, and when we get this second round of recycling taken along with it, it gets a bit, a bit complex. So, like watersheds, you never know what, whether the groundwater follows the surface structure of your watershed and whether the ground the watershed is really tight or not. These precipitation sheds, um, I don't think it, it, they will be legally tight and then we get conflicts and, and law cases about that. It will get pretty messy. I think we should take it at this point that, hey guys, in, in, in East Africa or the African Union, um, you can sort out things within Africa and the important areas where rainfall can be modified and influenced at, it, yeah, at that scale uh, yeah, and without going the full specific line that we see in watershed management. Because ultimately, the whole globe is yeah, I just wanted to part yes, of the precipitation shed of, of any other point. Go ahead, Cindy. I just right. wanted to say that yes, it's Cindy. sort of like Cindy, I'm just right. rebounding on what you proposed, Mina, that somehow we need to start the discussion. So a map, of course it's not to say there's frontiers, but if you look at countries with national borders, they do colonialism, they go elsewhere for resources, it's sort of the same idea. But it would be an idea of what are the best institutes to link up now, a way to make a proposition to get the discussion started. That's all. So, uh, yes, yes, I, I would like to add yes, so to this discussion that uh, I think our ability to do the mapping is still developing, and uh, we're not very good at it yet. Um, and there could still be great improvements in technology. I mean, evapotranspiration is one of the most difficult things to measure uh, that I know of, and this has been a technical problem that has dogged us for centuries. <laughs> and it's particularly uh, pressing now with the, 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 the impact of climate change. Um, uh, so some of the original, some of the groundwork for this mapping is now being done, but we still have quite a long way to go. Um, I certainly agree with Cindy that it would be great to have all of those maps and to know very precisely uh, what precipitation sheds or uh, what the precipitation sheds really are. Um, but uh, we still need to do a lot more work. I mean, I, 
I was participating in a paper very recently that it will hopefully get published soon, where we were asked specifically to provide an estimate of exactly how much moisture is changed by deforestation and the impact that would have on the catchment basin we were concerned with. And of course, we had to sort of try to provide a precise measure, but doing that uh, in, in numbers that are highly reliable is incredibly difficult to do right now. Um, you can, it's much easier to create ballpark measures that might be accurate, um, but uh, getting very precise measures is still quite difficult. Um, on the other hand, we should never uh, go to the stage of ignoring uh, the role of the precipitation shed or of the larger frameworks that supply atmospheric moisture to to all locations in the world, but we still have uh, a long way to go. Um, and I, I guess I would like to make one more point. Uh, the areas in these precipitation sheds that matter the most are the terrestrial surfaces, right? Because we can't really, Im um, we can't really impact oceanic evapotranspiration unless, of course, we can impact climate change uh, through mitigation, and hopefully we will be able to do that. But at the current moment, uh, we're not doing that as quickly as we really need to do it. Um, but we can impact what goes on on terrestrial surfaces, and that, of course, has a big impact on atmospheric moisture production from those services. Um, so the real focus for the most part needs to be on the terrestrial surfaces, on the loss or potential gain of vegetation and forest cover in particular that will contribute to uh, atmospheric moisture production and to the hydrologic cycle uh, overall. Um, um, thanks, David. Michael wants, has some comments to make on this as well. And then I don't know if Asta has, and then we'll come back to, to the presenters. Uh, just to, to add to what David was saying on, on complexity, I, I think, and this is something Astra and I have discussed and also Mina, I think what might be more important is, is increasing our knowledge base uh, by focusing on areas where we know there's the, we, we can link the process to the impact. So, for example, you know, there's been a lot of work on deforestation uh, in the Amazon and its uh, uh, coupling with regional climate. There's been almost nothing on the DRC, and there's, there's a lot of evidence to show that there is a link between deforestation and uh, food insecurity in Ethiopia. And so I think as these uh, regional foci, because there are definitely hot spots worth focusing on, um, that that's a way to sort of uh, maybe increase awareness. And uh, uh, regarding the, the Ethiopia work, Astra and I, we actually made it to the final round of a Diffid NERC uh, proposal. And, and so I know there's interest there. So uh, that's what I would recommend. Okay. Um, thanks, Michael. I don't know if Asta had any comments. I agree with what Michael said. I don't have any. Yeah. No? <coughs> OK. Um, Minor seems to have his hand up at some point. Minor? Yeah. Because uh, uh, maybe that is taking us to the discussion tomorrow. Uh, there is, of course, always this discussion among scientists in, in do we know enough um, to, to talk with policymakers about this part, do we need to have the full estimate of what percent it actually will mean um, before we should bother scientists with that part? I think tomorrow um, we should focus a bit on that. In, in, in do we know enough to bring this to the international negotiation forum? Um, my own sense is there is important stuff here that is quite different from current understanding. It is important to bring it on the table. It is important to focus on those things that we do know, it is a focus where it helps with no neglect options, etc. Um, but yes, uh, of course scientists always want more time for research and more detail, and there's an awful lot of interesting things in what Cindy is talking about. Um, are all the trees of the world, how do they differ, etc., etc. We would love to, as scientists, to work on that point. Um, but how much do we need to know before we start this policy debate. And my own take is this is tough. It is important that we get 
the Chinese government to understand that their influence in Myanmar may have feedback on their own climate. It is important within Africa that we get at least a debate about, hey, hey what are you doing with your land cover influences me before we have the final detail and the final number correct. But maybe that is a point for hopefully people in the you know, virtual participants can think about the effect on it and it will be a point to pick up tomorrow. Right? We've heard a lot of very interesting technical stuff, but do we know enough to bring this on the policy platform discussion and how do we deal with the uncertainty and, and the need for further refinement that we still have? Maybe that, that's a nice point for our facilitators to reflect on and, and get us into tomorrow. Yes, but thank you for that very provocating statement and also like an introduction for tomorrow's session. So please join us tomorrow at the same time, 3 p.m. GMT plus 7 or Indonesian Bogor time. And as I mentioned, uh, but I mean to mention that tomorrow we will have another round of discussion. It will be very interesting as it will translate the knowledge to action. And please also not to forget that you also can contribute to enhance the next research agenda on this issue. Okay, uh, let me wrap up. Uh, Peter, do you want to... No, uh, thank you just to say thank you to the point. presenters. I think it's been great. Um, and, and we look forward to tomorrow's discussion. I think everyone in the room would agree with me. It's been, it's been interesting. I can see everyone nodding. So, thank you and bye to Bogor. <laughs> thank Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Peter. Bye-bye. Thank you, all the speakers. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe just to remind all the, the virtual participants, please keep adding questions to us. We will compile them overnight. And tomorrow we start with a reflection on whatever has come in from the people who are not in the room and not maybe not in the same time zone. Yeah, so please keep adding that to the chat room. And please keep thinking about it so tomorrow we'll have an even better second stage. Thank you all. I think they are cool. Yeah.